Hello, and welcome to the HIV RNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing with access to over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. For more information, check the link in the description below or the bio section of our channel. Today, we're going to pull back the curtain on a really devastating virus that has for way too long been hiding in plain sight, affecting millions of people all over the world with almost no one talking about it. So let's just start with a question that really gets to the heart of this whole thing. I mean, what if there was a virus out there infecting, say, 10, maybe even 20 million people, and it was just completely ignored? For millions, this isn't some hypothetical. It is their reality. And for some communities, that reality is just staggering. Get this. In some remote indigenous communities in Central Australia, the rate of infection for this virus, which is called HTLV-1, is as high as 40%. 40! That's a number that when immunologist Damien Purcell first saw it, he said it blew his socks off. And you can see why. So what is this thing, HTLV-1? Well, it's actually the very first human retrovirus ever found. Think of it as a relative of HIV. And once you have it, you have it for life. Over time, it can cause all sorts of awful, life-threatening diseases, from a really aggressive cancer to chronic lung problems. Okay, so how does this virus actually work? How does it manage to turn our own bodies against us? Well, to really understand the threat, we've got to look at its attack plan, which is, honestly, it's as unique as it is sneaky. To really get a handle on HTLV-1, it's super helpful to compare it to its much more famous cousin, HIV. Now, while HIV is a relatively modern virus, HTLV-1 is ancient. I'm talking, they found its DNA in 1,500-year-old mummies. But the biggest difference is how they attack. HIV makes new virus particles that burst out of a cell. HTLV-1, it does something much, much quieter. So here's the playbook. The virus sneaks into one of your key immune cells, a T cell. Then it stitches its own genetic code right into your DNA and just goes silent. It lays low. Then it starts rewiring the cell, hijacking its programming and forcing it to just divide over and over and over. So see, the virus doesn't spread by making copies of itself. It spreads by making copies of its host cell. And this is where it gets really terrifying. Your own immune cells, the very cells that are supposed to protect you, are turned into these undead agents of the virus. They just crowd out all the healthy cells, they stop doing their job, and they become what that same immunologist, Damien Purcell, calls immunozombies. Which, you know, brings us right back to that big mystery. This virus was discovered before HIV, it affects millions of people, so why has it been called the poor cousin of retroviruses? Why has there been decades of just silence and so little progress? Well, a huge part of the problem really just comes down to money. Or a lack of it. The virus has been chronically underfunded because the people it hits hardest are often in communities that have been historically overlooked, marginalized, and indigenous populations all around the globe. And without that support, a lot of researchers just walked away. But here's the fascinating thing. The virologist Amanda Panful points out that there's this weird silver lining. The lack of resources has forced the small, really passionate group of researchers who stuck around to get incredibly creative and collaborative. They literally have to be more innovative to get anything done. And all that innovation, it's finally starting to pay off. Seriously, there's a new dawn of hope here, with this whole wave of new strategies aimed at finally cornering and taking down HTLV-1 for good. The new game plan is to attack the virus right where it hurts by going after two proteins that it absolutely needs to survive, its Achilles heel. One protein is called tax, and it's essential for getting the infection started. The other one, HBZ, is what keeps those zombie cells alive and dividing. All right, first up, and this is pretty smart, researchers are actually repurposing drugs that were made for HIV. One study found that if you combine these existing drugs with another compound, they could effectively kill off the HTLV-1 infected cells in mice. It's a really clever workaround. Second, they're developing brand new drugs that directly target the virus's own machinery. Remember that tax protein that kicks the whole thing off? Well, new research has found a class of drugs that can basically force that protein to self-destruct, which in turn kills the infected T cell. Pretty cool. Third, and this one is probably going to sound familiar, they're designing a preventative mRNA vaccine. Just like with other modern vaccines, this one targets the virus's spike protein. That's the key it uses to get into our cells. And using lessons they learned the hard way from HIV research, they figured out how to present this protein in its most vulnerable, spring-loaded state, making it a way better target for our immune system. 
And fourth, this is where things get really futuristic, CRISPR. Yep, researchers are using this gene editing tool to go right into those zombie cells and literally snip out the viral genes like TAX and HBZ. It is like disarming the virus at a genetic level. Now, this incredible push in science isn't just happening in some isolated lab. And this is maybe the most important part. It's deeply, deeply connected to the very communities it's trying to help. And that's creating a whole new powerful dynamic in this fight. What makes this all so promising is the partnership behind it. Scientists are working hand in hand with indigenous leaders, creating what Purcell calls a beautiful two-way dialogue. The community sees that the solution is in the science, and this collaboration makes sure that all these breakthroughs actually turn into real-world help for the people who need it most. So, after decades of being forgotten, the story of HTLV-1 is finally becoming one of hope and incredible innovation. And it leaves us with one last big question to think about. Could the way this is being handled, this mix of scientific creativity and deep community partnership, could that be the blueprint for how we fight other neglected diseases all around the world?